Welcome to Digital Asset News, taking the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets, and breaking down to bite-sized pieces. Today, this is actually the video that I had previously recorded on June 30th, 2020. The reason I'm uploading this again is because it was mysteriously deleted. I've already contacted YouTube, they did an investigation, and from what they tell me, the person who deleted the video was me. And I can tell you right now, I did not delete this video. It was a pretty good one. It had a lot of views, a lot of engagement, and people were enjoying it, so it made no sense to me. However, I'm gonna have you watch it, and you be the judge, and let me know if you think there's anything in here that would cause this video to be mysteriously deleted by the powers that be. All right, let's jump right in. Got some interesting stuff. First up, helicopter money is coming, and it's actually going to be good and bad for Bitcoin and the rest of the economy. Also, an update to the mainnet launch provided by Charles Hoskinson, where he also talks about how Cardano differs from Bitcoin and Ethereum. And finally, we're going to take a look at a fantastic interview brought to you by Unchained Podcast. This was Mike Novogratz and Raul Pal, And they sat down and talked with the host about what is going on with Bitcoin, where it's going to go, and what potentially we can all expect in the next months and years to come. But first, what's going on with the market? Well, looks like everything is going pretty much sideways. Bitcoin is at 91.30, and over the past 24 hours, there has been approximately 0.0% change. So that's fantastic. Seven days though, down 6%. Ethereum over last week, down almost 8%. Tether's Tether, XRP, 17 cents, wow. Uh, Bitcoin Cash, SV, everything else pretty much the same. Stellar, up by 2.7%. So nothing really fantastic, just pretty much a sideways days. Except for Compound, they took a little bit of a, of a dip, 7.6 and 24% over the last week, which not really surprising. We'll see how that project works out. I think it should do good things as far as DeFi, but uh, my money's on Celsius. All right, before we start, I wanted to make mention of, uh, I did a poll and I actually uh, I had a post on the community where I had asked a question about eToro. Uh, if you don't know, in the description of uh, pretty much all of my videos, I had a uh, referral code for eToro. The problem was, is that I kept getting um, responses by people because they were having problems so i actually reached out to eToro and i had a couple of issues myself and uh it is still unresolved and it's been now going on two and a half weeks and that was actually an issue that i have with finances there's another issue i had uh that we were going back and forth as far as like providing a dollar cost average uh versus trader challenge i want to do a couple things and kind of bring attention to eToro and this has been going on for three months and uh so that's one issue but financial issue shouldn't take two and a half weeks to really clarify and the customer service in my opinion has been um, catastrophic we will say so I just asked the question to everybody else I thought well maybe it's just me you know maybe I just have a problem uh, but then so the first one I had 29 responses and it was all pretty much negative and then I went a step further and I just said hey for those of you who had any interaction with the Toro uh, tell me how bad it is and I was expecting to be somewhere between three and four and one was awful and five was outstanding and I thought maybe it gets you know a majority fours and then some threes but really what it is is 28 percent of you said it's awful like the worst of the worst and then uh 17 percent uh said it's really bad I mean not the worst but it's pretty bad and if you look at that I mean that's like that's a huge amount we're looking at what 45 percent somewhere around there 44 45 46 and then the next biggest one was 40. So if you have customer service that is, uh, you know, 85% awful uh, or just, you know, kind of crappy, uh, I can't promote that. So I've already gone through most of the videos and uh, I don't have, I won't have an affiliate link with that. Uh, same thing with Coinbase uh, because, you know, why would I uh, promote something that sucks? So. Uh, that's it. Uh, so thanks for giving me your feedback. Really appreciate it. Let's jump into today's stories. So first up, helicopter money. Everybody's favorite. A uh, U.S. stimulus-backed rebound could fuel a Bitcoin bull rally. Here's why. And this whole article is great. Uh, it's well written and everything else. But the thing is, is that you have to understand that uh, helicopter money, it, it, it can only take you so far. And really, it's going to be bound to fail. I'm going to tell you why. So um, what's going on is that uh, the benchmark cryptocurrency, and they are talking about Bitcoin, surged 0.78% to a whopping 91.84, a move that aptly tailed the recovery sentiment in the S&P 500. I love that word surged, like it was just so fantastic. Um, cryptocurrency digital asset market, uh, it is not the S&P 500. So when we get a 1%, less than 1% surge, that's not a surge. 
that's a blip. That's a yawn. That's nothing. So uh, it's something that we're not used to. And uh, maybe in the traditional finance, that's awesome. But for us, that sucks. So anyhow, it goes on to state about speculative optimism. S&P 500's Wall Street peers, NASDAQ, Composite, and Dow Jones also inch higher by 2.3% and 1.2% respectively. The Wall Street Journal credited pure speculative optimism for the S&P 500's rebound, knowing that expectations of a new stimulus package kept traders bullish about the index. So here's the thing. This to me is uh, it's scary on, on, on many levels. You got a bunch of people who, they know one thing, buy the dip. Because they've heard it for so long, by the dip, by the dip, by the dip. But the problem is, is that you've got people who have uh, really no idea what they're investing into. Like uh, Hertz is a prime example. Uh, you had a, a ton of people who invested into that because there was a huge dip. Problem was, Hertz went into bankruptcy. So good luck getting your money back. Uh, and that was a big FOMO type of thing. And, and people are going to end up getting wrecked. So uh, we see this type of thing where people get stimulus money. They get helicopter money. They're like, well, I got to do something with it. And I hear this thing to buy the dip. And then, you know, Robin Hood is really easy to use. And then, boom, I'm just going to you know, just dump it all on that. And then it's just not a good uh, thing to do, I believe. So when we get the stimulus package and then yet the S&P 500 goes up, people are like, oh, the economy is doing fantastic. Uh, no, that's not how it works. So I, I think the smart money um, is, is still going to invest because they know it's going to go up because the Fed's going to bail everything out. But if you are actually trying to uh, invest for the long term, uh, that is insane. I, I see a lot of problems coming up and uh, I don't know exactly what's going to happen because I'm not Nostradamus. But I can tell you uh, that this cannot last forever. So I don't think that helicopter money is sound economic policy for growth. But let me know what you think in the comments section. I just don't see it. Moving on, the S&P 500 peaked at 3,200 points in June. That's amazing. It's on track of reaching its all-time high, even as conflicting poor fundamentals led by the rise in COVID infections jitters investors. So imagine that. Uh, during this time when we had over 41% uh, of small businesses actually closing, which we covered yesterday, and uh, we have record unemployment and all these different problems that are happening in the economy, yet the uh, Wall Street still goes up. And I understand that people are you know, always telling me, well, you know, the you know, Wall Street and NASDAQ and the SP 500, they're betting on the future. Well, how far in the future are you betting? I mean, are you betting on six months, 18 months, three years, five years? Because I got to tell you, this this growth, I don't see a V-shaped recovery. I mean, W at best. So uh, we will see. But observers, it states that observers believe that the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Congress will keep injecting money into the economy to help sustain the rebound. And uh, just so you know, uh, for those of you who are not in the United States, um, Trump, President Trump, is facing a re-election uh, coming up on uh, November. So we're like, what, five months away, six months away, somewhere around there. Uh, so he's going to pull out all the stops. And what he is trying to do then is there's been huge talk about a second stimulus check uh, coming about. And... Uh, this was put out by the uh, Forbes, and they say that uh, they don't know all the details, but we can walk you through everything we know so far, including the stimulus check details found in the HEROES Act, which passed the House and is awaiting a vote in Congress. Finally, keep in mind this is an election year. Several reports say President Trump is in favor of a second stimulus check. We understand that a second stimulus check may help his chances at another election. So, I mean, if I was at another election, sure, I'd be like, hey, uh, let's just uh, throw some money, see how it all works out. Moving on, it states, uh, this is a quote, there's a safety net under the bond market and the market or the equity market, said Philip Blancato, the president of Ladenburg Thalman Asset Management. And there's a saying uh, which goes, uh, it's cool until it's not. Everything's good until it's not. So if the Fed is going to be bailing this out, I mean, really the question is, how long can the Fed keep bailing everything out? How much money can they print? How long can this go for? Because if you haven't stayed up to the news, just you know, here in the States, um, we just had 15 states have paused or reversed the plans to reopen. Uh, even in my state of Texas, everything now is now back to lockdown. So you got North Carolina, Louisiana, Florida, Texas, Nevada, also Montana. Uh, Arizona was uh, another big one that just said, nope, we can't because the round of infections is on the rise. And if you have those type of infections up and it keeps happening, it keeps happening, then you're going to have uh, a pullback. And this is another uh, report which talks about this is from the, the WHO, the World Health Organization. And I know the World Health Organization hasn't been on the uh, solid, almost salad of footings uh, because there are different uh, problems with uh, China and favoritism and whatever else is going on. However, I will say this, um, the things that they are talking about now 
uh, have actually come true. And when he and when the WHO says, "Hey, look, this isn't the you know the worst is yet to come," everybody's like, "You're crazy. This thing is going to go away in the summer and no problems." Well, guess what happened? Uh, it is 103 today here in El Paso, and we have doubled. Uh, our infection rate since yesterday. And then in my other city that I live in, in Houston, they've had a massive influx and uh, they were having problems as far as like the ICU and ventilators because they were getting maxed out. So if we think about these things and we look at what's going to happen, what's going to go on, well, this pandemic, which was supposed to kind of sputter out in this time frame, is not doing that. It is actually doing the opposite and accelerating in certain parts of the world. Now, every part of the world is not going to accelerate. We're going to have some kind of downtrodden, but if you look at what's going on, it does not look too fantastic. So in this article, it states another wave of panic could be devastating for markets as well. The stock market's V-shaped recovery could be in jeopardy. Another crash could make the structure from a W rather than a V-shape. And uh, again, I've been saying this for a while now. I just don't see a V-shape recovery from all the different things that are happening. I mean, if you look at uh, retail and hospitality and uh, uh, public health and sports and uh, gyms. I mean, all these different businesses are slowing down, which is really the backbone of uh, most of the economy, especially here in America. So I don't see how um, we can actually uh, spend our way out of this or print our way out of this. I think there's going to be a lot of problems coming up. But again, I mean, I could be wrong. I, <laughs> Who knows? Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section. But I will just say this. I if there's going to be a big dip, make sure you have some money on the sidelines to buy that dip. Uh, I never am a big fan of going all in and just, you know, putting all my chips in on, on one day. Dollar cost average in, and then when you see some slides come, uh, especially like big ones, uh, if you were ready for the March slide, the March dip, you made a killing. And uh, it's, I see it happening again. So that's what I will do. And uh, that's... Uh, maybe you should... Maybe you could look into that. Not financial advice, all that good stuff. And then... Um, Here's a something from Willy Wu comes up with some model, which predicts another bull run in a month. And <laughs> okay, sure, right, whatever. Uh, I gotta tell you, like I talked about TA yesterday, and I just had a couple of people go, "I can't believe you don't believe in TA, and it's just ridiculous." And da da da. If if that's your belief, that's your belief. Sure, go ahead. But I mean, if you're gonna think that uh, there's a, a bull run coming another month, God bless you. Great, sounds good. Anyhow, let's move on. Next up. Cardano. Uh, this is how it differs from Bitcoin or Ethereum. This is a pretty good one. Charles Hoskinson is fast becoming my favorite CEO uh, because he just makes like, he just kind of says what it is. And like, I mean, if, if you believe him or don't believe him, you love him, you hate him. He's entertaining. <laughs> this is all I can say. So he goes on his talk about, he says, look, this was an interview from uh, Altcoin Buzz. He says, with Bitcoin, this was the first mover. This was the first generation. Really, it was the concept of can you have decentralized money, decentralized transfer value, decentralized ledger, and, and somehow, some way, a dynamic and decentralized network will maintain that. This is not the case before Bitcoin. No one ever pulled it off. The problem with Bitcoin is that it's so simplistic. It's not a criticism. It was a design feature that the architects of the system were trying to push. He goes on to state that with Bitcoin, you can't issue assets. You can't do a comp complex contractual relationship or a smart contract. You can't do dApps and DeFi and all those things. I know that people are going to be like, no, 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 Bitcoin can do smart contracts. Sure. Uh, but from here, what he's talking about is like some type of com complex contractual relationship. Whatever he means in that regard, uh, maybe different, uh, you know, higher level things. I don't know. But uh, when he's talking about these things, it's just very, it's very interesting. And I'm going to show you a, a video in a second of why I think he's actually right. So he was going to say that the point of Ethereum, which was the first second generation crypto, was to try to understand what that model looked like. So it took everything from the prior generation, decentralized ledger, the dynamic and decentralized control. But then it said, hey, now all of a sudden your transactions are programmable. And he said, while Ethereum's programmability opening doors, Hoskinson says the second largest cryptocurrency is limited by its inability to scale and share data with traditional systems. So, but there's a there's a way around that. Uh, you know, Ethereum 2.0 is coming out with the sharding. I mean, if you want to use oracles like Chainlink, I mean they can pull outside data. So it's a two-pier two-prong system, but you can't do it. He says it's not good enough to just say, hey, we're gonna build a system that's blind and deaf. <laughs> And it doesn't really understand or see the world around it. We need to build a system that's aware that there are other systems and can communicate with more and more value and information. So finishing up, Hoskinson says that the limitations he sees in both Bitcoin and Ethereum led to the creation of Cardano. So when you bundle these three things together, interoperability, scalability, and sustainability, 
that functionality creates what we call a third generation cryptocurrency. Makes sense. So that's Charles in a nutshell. Um, and there's two things that I, I want to make mention. First of all, I kept mentioning that uh, the timeline was, you know, the launch was uh, end of June, and then maybe if we needed to, July 7th was the last part. But actually, I was incorrect. So this was an article which was written on May 29th, and I think I just left some, some things out. So someone corrected me yesterday. I forgot who it was. I'm sorry, but thanks for correcting me. I appreciate it. But there was, here was the timeline, essentially. Uh, Hoskinson talks about uh, these things take place in 11 steps. So the first one was May 11th, um, which was the launch of Friends and Family Test Network. Next one was June 9th, Haskell Shelley Test Network. Uh, they can run a stake pool. June 16th, the public test uh, network will be open to all users. And the wallet, the node, and all that stuff. June 23rd, the Combinator hard fork uh, took place. And so that's all been done, right? So we're there. Provided this test runs smoothly, and I think it has, the Shelly client will be released on June 30th and will be available for anyone to download. As a precaution, in case there are problems, July 7th is available as a backup. So that's where I was going. Okay, July 7th. It states here, users will have four weeks or three weeks from that date to upgrade their software until the Shelly may not hard fork on July 29th. So I guess I was right. But not right. So just to make sure we're all clear, uh, we're going all the way to July 7th in case there's some some hiccups. And then July 29th is the hard fork, and that's when everything is supposed to be fantastic. So we'll see how that goes. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to talk about is um, when Charles is talking about how great Cardano is, the question that in my mind is first mover advantage, and is that really true? And is Cardano... Is that going to be like the Google Chrome or is it going to be Microsoft Edge? I want to talk about can be fantastically illustrated by our friends over at Data is Beautiful. They do fantastic work here. And what they're talking about is the most popular internet browsers, 96 to 2019. And I put this on double X speed because if you want to watch the whole thing, it's kind of boring. Uh, but at do X, it's actually kind of interesting. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start this little guy right now. And remember Netscape Navigator? Well, if you do, you're old like me. But uh, here's the Internet Explorer. And this was a 99, mind you. And once Explorer came about, because Netscape Navigator was the first. And some people will say, well, that's what Bitcoin is, isn't it? It's Netscape Navigator. I don't know if that's true. But maybe it's like Internet Explorer. Who knows? Uh, one of the first ones. And it was dominating what, four years, five years, six years, seven years? And then came Firefox. I remember Firefox, and it was awesome. It was so fast. It worked out pretty well. And before you know it, you're like, oh, Firefox is going to be like the one to take over everything over. And then there's this thing called Chrome. And Chrome came from nowhere, and all of a sudden just started to get market share. And now we're, you know, coming up to 2010, 11, 12, and look what happens. Chrome starts to dominate. And then Explorer, which had done so much for so long, a decade, falls the wayside. Now that's Microsoft. And Microsoft, Microsoft said, you know what? We're going to make Microsoft Edge and we're going to get rid of Explorer because that's going to be the new wave and we're Microsoft and we can do anything we want to because we're awesome. Well, the problem with Edge is it never just gained traction and it just kind of fell to the wayside. And um, that's a problem if you are one of these big conglomerates within they can do whatever they want to big innovation really doesn't come from like these big huge companies it comes from smaller companies which are nimble and quick they don't have to be uh, saddled with all these different uh, levels of of leadership or management and they just make things happen so when we see let me reverse this we see something like this google chrome came from nowhere so the question really is 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 cardano google chrome and they're going to start to take over uh, maybe they take over ethereum because of what they talked about all those different three uh, aspects or are they Microsoft Edge? That it sounds great, and they, and they, and they made this fantastic uh, product, just didn't work out for whatever reason. And then just so you know, if you don't know what Microsoft Edge is, I didn't know, I had to look it up. I was like, oh, it's well, it's for Microsoft, it's supposed to take over Internet Explorer. Uh, they're actually gonna get rid of Microsoft Edge and go to some other thing called Chromium something or other, uh, because it's just not working out. And the reason they did that was because they said, oh, Microsoft Edge is going to be uh, so much faster and we're going to have interoperability and it's going to be fantastic for the internet and people can build on it. Well, guess what? Nobody used it. So the question again now is, is Cardano Google Chrome or is it Microsoft Edge? That's the big question. All right. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Let's move on. Lastly, 
Unchained podcast. Um, I had seen this around, and uh, I catch them every so often, but they're very long. Uh, usually they, they're like an hour. Sometimes they're 30, 45 minutes, but mostly it's like an hour. To, it's a podcast, right? It's a long uh, format. So, but, but this one was exceptional, and I have to give it to Laura Shin. She did a fantastic job here. And uh, if you don't know Unchained podcast, uh, you can subscribe to it. It's fantastic. Actually, I'm going to do that right now. Subscribe. And... Um, who is Laura Shin? Let's just get it out of the way because we always want to know who's putting pen to paper or who's talking and who's giving us all the information. So Laura Shin is a crypto blockchain journalist, hosts the uh, podcast we just talked about. She's a former senior editor at Forbes, uh, first mainstream reporter to cover crypto, graduated Phi Beta Kappa with honors from Stanford, Master's Arts from Columbia School of Journalism. And when she is interviewing people, you can tell she's like a real journalist. Like she's not like me. I'm just an opinion person. I give you some information and I, you know, inject my opinions or whatever else. She has, she's smart and she's got uh, really great questions and she puts out, you know, the right information. So what she's got is two of the heavyweights these days, um, Mike Novogratz, Raul Pal, and a couple, and she actually, we covered her a couple of videos ago when she had uh, Shamath, Polyapatai on, where we discovered that Shamath had no idea what DeFi was, <laughs> which was interesting. So um, here, I'm not going to play the whole thing. Obviously, this is an hour, but there was three things that to go over. One, I was wrong about Mike Novogratz because when Mike Novogratz here, who is the uh, uh, CEO of Galaxy Digital, Raul Pal is a macro economist, and we've featured him on the on the channel before. When he's talking about, Mike Novogratz here is talking about, hey, it's really difficult to buy Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. I was like, Who, what is this guy talking about? But I get now why he said that when he when he talks in a little bit. And they're talking about quantitative easing and the reason for the Bitcoin rise. And then they're going to talk about all that helicopter money and why it's good and bad. So let's just take a listen. And listen, this is an adoption story. Um, and if Bitcoin was easy to buy, it would be a lot higher. And so... We've dealt with a few hedge funds that are buying it, right? They've got to go through all the due diligence for their funds, and and you know it's a two to four week process for their for their back office to feel comfortable. Um, and so it's not like pick up the phone and call. Uh, then they gotta usually talk to their board. Hey, we're gonna buy crypto for the first time. And so that's a great point. I never thought about that. I'm like, okay, this is my problem. I always think about me. And how I do things, but I have to look at it from the other side. So Novogratz is in that traditional market type of place. So when he's talking about these hedge fund managers and these institutions, there are a lot of steps they have to take to actually buy things. They can't just go, hey, you know what? I'm just going to go to uh, Gemini and just pick up some Bitcoin for my clients. They can't do that. So they, they have to go through a lot of hoops. So when he says it's difficult to buy Bitcoin, he's talking about institutional investors and he's right. I get it. The next thing I want to bring up was he has his pulse on the next big buyers and I thought about these this group and now I really see it once this group gets in things should take off let's take a listen a new group of buyers that are coming they're not here yet uh, the financial advisor community is giant right you think the, the bulk of the wealth in America and in Europe is not owned by Gen Z or Millennials though they'd like it it's owned by you know Gen X and baby boomers uh, and older and you know the 50 to 80 year olds uh, they don't have bread wallets or Coinbase wallets uh, or Venmo apps, uh, you know, and so getting the financial advisors to feel comfortable to then sell it to them is a process at Galaxy that we're really working hard on. Uh, that's being amped up in a big way, not just. And I got to tell you, there's no reason why a financial analyst, as things start to move and start to really get in place, why they would not put that out to their uh, investors, to their clients. So if you haven't seen this one yet, this was actually put together by, uh, it was James Tudaro, MD. I found this through um, Twitter. Actually, it actually was sent to me by a subscriber. Then I had to uh, actually slow it down because it was just too, too much all over the place. But uh, this is the best performing um, investments over the last decade as far as percentage ROI. And if you look at it real quick, uh, if you look at, Dom first of all, Domino's Pizza, 23% uh, return on investment. Amazing, it's, it's Domino's, Netflix. This is this is February 2010 is where we are starting. But if we go through this, I just wanna show you that, um, you know, once Bitcoin gets in there, which is going to be around 2013, I believe. Oops, went too fast. So look at look at Bitcoin, just pop up, pop up, pop, pop, 
and now we're going at a thousand X around a thousand in 2013 and it falls about domino somehow <laughs> overtakes it a little bit but if you're starting to think about these uh, financial planners these financial analysts and the people that actually recommend certain assets to their clients when they do and they come in there and they're like hey Pete here's here's the thing there's a lot of things going on with the market. We don't know what's going to happen. All this helicopter money's coming in. There's a lot of uncertainty, especially with the Federal Reserve printing to quantitative easing. We don't know what's going to happen. However, there is this asset, and it is the best performing asset class of the last decade. It's new. It's a little volatile, but we think it's going to have huge gains. And over the last, you know, 10 years, it's done, uh, you know, thousands of X percentage of ROI. So what we want to do is we want to take 1%, 1 to 3% of your portfolio and put it in this thing called Bitcoin. All right, sounds good, John. I think if you can just do that, these planners, there's no reason why they wouldn't do that. Or, you know, you can put it into Ethereum and we can take a look at Ethereum and see how much that goes up. So um, when Novogratz is talking about these big players, these people, I was like, that's true. If they can get in the game, then it would be game over. So we will see. Anyhow, now Mike's going to talk about institutional FOMO. And I think this is going to be the big catalyst. So let's take a listen. So I think in the next few months, you're going to see a lot of FAs putting their clients into this. And also, Mike, as you know, is the whole, the structure of this is everyone's got their eye on it. And the, if the price moves up, everyone gets FOMO and has to get involved. And that's the in, at institutional level now. Yes. So if it goes up further, the more it goes up, the more the market cap goes up, the more they can justify it to their trustees and the more people get involved. So I think we're at that tipping point of a virtuous cycle that can continue for a while, but we just need to get through these levels first. But I think essentially every institution, every RAA is almost kind of short the upside calls. Not, not really. I mean, obviously there's a bunch of people who are, but really what it's all about is people don't have it and they need to get it, but they wait for the price for confirmation. So it makes sense, right? So I can, I can see all that. And then Laura's going to ask a very smart question. She's a very smart person, journalist, right? And she's going to ask him like, okay, what, is the, what are the driving factors? What's really going to push these people over the edge? What is the determining situation that's going to lead to Bitcoin to go to wherever you could call it, the moon? The decision makers have made the decision. It's just kind of a matter of time to let those decisions play out in the market and we should see the price rise. But I'm wondering, like, so what is it that's driving those decision makers? Um, like, what is it about Bitcoin that makes them think that this is the investment to make now during the time of the coronavirus? Is it just as simple as like Bitcoin is scarce and we're about to see unlimited quantitative easing? Or is there anything kind of more? It's just that simple. <laughs> And that's pretty much it. So uh, if you have a chance, I highly recommend to uh, listen to the whole uh, podcast. Um, it's an hour long, a little bit long, but uh, hey, if you got nothing else going on because you're on lockdown like me, <laughs> why don't you take a listen? So uh, that is it for today. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. I really appreciate it. And as always, I want to say thanks to the supporters. The so level ones, they give me a, a tip of a couple dollars, and I really appreciate everybody that does that. Thanks so much. Level two. Pay a little bit more and uh, they get a shout out. So, all right, soft. Wen Mullet, myself, who else? Dave Plummer, Grant Sharman, Bruce Wood, Baking Benjamins, Noel Flippin Vegas, Martin Lewin, Michael Ralph, William Howell, Crazy Crypto Canuck, Tessie Ryusaki Positive, Troke LLC, JC Durex, Crypto Veritas, John Miller, The Office, L. Merg, Michael Jeffrey, The Kell Show, Mage Research. Andrew Herrera, Terry Prospery, XRP Carolina, whatever, AE, and Hero Soap Company. They do soap. And uh, that's it. Lastly, my uh, email is at news at gmail. There's a scammer going by the name of dandigitalassetnew at gmail.com. They're trying to get you into uh, trading something or other, but I don't trade, so uh, I don't know what they're doing. So if you get something like that, just uh, put it in the spam folder if you got time. And that's it. So thanks a lot. And I'll see you on the next one.